thank you all for today's talk on introduction to discrete event simulation by Dr. Neha Karanchkar from IIT Goa. Dr. Neha is an assistant professor in CSE at IIT Goa. She's also the vice president of the Goa ACM chapter. Her areas of research include ACE in modeling, simulation, and optimization of discrete event systems and the application areas of computer architecture, Internet of Things, and digital twins. She obtained her AmTech and PhD degrees from the Electrical Engineering Department at IIT Bombay and was a postdoc fellow at the Robert Bosch Center for Cyber Physical Systems, ISC Bangalore. She was also a member of the JEET Indigenous Processor Development Project at IIT Bombay. And we welcome you all again and over to you, Neha. Thank you so much for the talk today. Uh, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. So if it is okay, let's start with the tutorial. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay, great. So let's get started. So uh, welcome everyone. And this is the first in the tutorial series that uh, we are starting. Uh, we hope there'll be many more uh, such presentations. So basically this tutorial series is an introduction to a particular area or a particular idea. Uh, it assumes very little prerequisite knowledge. So it is accessible to most people. And it, uh, the, the target is to get people excited about a particular idea or a particular area of work and to give you pointers or resources to learn more if you want to go deeper in a particular area. So today's talk is going to be on introduction to discrete event simulation. So first I'd like to just mention uh, why this tutorial. So first of all, this happens to be my uh, area of interest. Uh, although I'm not a subject expert in the broad area of simulation, simulation sciences, uh, I have uh, had the uh, experience of building a few simulation frameworks, in particular uh, discrete event simulation frameworks for computer architecture and for IoT applications. And uh, so I found this idea to be very elegant and very useful. If you uh, remember your basic CS courses like digital logic design or computer architecture or networks, Discrete event simulation is used in a variety of these systems to analyze or to simulate them. In addition to computer systems, you will also find this being used in operations research or uh, optimization of manufacturing systems or industrial processes, assembly lines, and so on, or simulation of airports, that is uh, flights arriving, customers arriving, leaving, and how many counters should you have at the airport, banks or retail stores, any kind of systems where there are some customers arriving and there are queues and there are services and so on. Okay. So um, why I want to talk about this is discrete event simulation. The basic idea is very elegant and I find it very simple to understand in comparison to, uh, I mean, it's, it's more simple to implement than continuous simulation. So continuous simulation, again, is a separate area of uh, work that has been a large body of work in that area since many years. But discrete event simulation, although it's so much uh, used, so widely used, uh, often in CS curriculum, it is not included. And it is such a small idea that it can be taught to somebody in uh, an hour or uh, you know one and a half hours of a tutorial session. And therefore, uh, I think this tutorial will be useful to many of you. Although it is not talking about any particular simulation tool for networks or computer architectures and so on. Essentially, all of them work in a similar manner at the core if they are using discrete event simulation. And once you understand the idea, you may be able to uh, understand why your simulation is not working sometimes or why you're getting certain kinds of results. So it is actually useful to know how it works. So what are we going to talk about today? Uh, we will talk about what is discrete event simulation and how can we perform discrete event simulation. That is, if you were to write a program for doing discrete event simulation in C++ or Python, how could you go about doing it? And then we will talk about one particular library 
in Python. So since many of you will be aware of Python programming language uh, and you may be familiar with it, Python provides a library called SymPy. Uh, it stands for simulation in Python. And it is a discrete event simulation library. And it is a general purpose library. Like it is not specifically for network simulation or for um, architecture simulation or digital logic or so on. It is a general purpose discrete event simulation library. And uh, that makes it uh, more applicable to any new kinds of examples that you want to simulate. And it's very simple to use, very elegant. So we'll just introduce you to this library. And uh, lastly, I will share some useful resources and links and directions that you can pursue further if you want to go deeper in this area. All right. So let's start. So before we even get to what is discrete event simulation, I want to start with a motivation example, motivational example. So we are going to consider the case where suppose uh, you know you decide to change your career tracks, whatever, and you decide to start a vada pav stall. Okay. And you want to do some analysis or optimization, being aware of um, simulation concepts, you want to simulate a vada pav stall and understand some things about it before actually uh, running the shop, or you want to make some changes. So let's make some assumptions. So you have a vada pav stall and say it is open from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. And uh, suppose you know that people arrive more in some rush hours, like in the morning between 8 a.m. to 9 a.m., more people arrive. And let's say uh, the average time between people's arrival is one minute to two minutes. Like if this is the time axis and here are people arriving, you know, they arrive. The average time between two people arriving, we can assume it to be one minute to two minutes. That means it's more closely spaced in the rush hours and more far apart in the non rush hours. That is other other timings other than 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. to 2 p.m. So we have these inter uh, arrival times. OK. And they are random. Actually, you see th there's some value here and some value here and so on. But typically there is a rush hour and there are these other times. OK, suppose you have observed this behavior. And in your stall, there can be six persons sitting, six people can sit. Further, suppose you assume that the customers behave like this. If a customer comes to your stall and if they find all seats are occupied, they will just leave. They will not order any food. May mainly they come to sit at a place maybe. If there is a seat, if they can find a seat empty, then they order food and then they sit and eat for about 15 to 30 minutes. And each customer that is served generates a profit of rupees 100 for your stall. So, okay, so every customer served is generating a profit, not just like the money earned, but profit. That means you are selling some really expensive vada pav. Maybe it is at an airport or something. Okay, if you are generating a profit of 100 per customer, that is a lot. So, it must be something like a, at an airport or something. So, let's assume that. Okay, and so suppose you want to use simulation to get insights on some things like you want to know, okay, if this is the case, what is the average profit I'm making per day? Okay. Then you might want to ask some what if kind of questions like, uh, hey, what fraction of the arriving customers are currently leaving because all the seats are occupied? Because you have only six seats and the customers who find all the seats occupied are leaving. Or you may want to ask, suppose you were to buy some extra seats. Uh, then is it worthwhile? And see, because it's at an airport, some may be at a food uh, food stall in an airport lounge. Uh, if you want to get extra seating space, it will cost you. But it, it's not costing that much. It is costing rupees 100 per seat per day. Okay, so in a month, if you are buying two new seats, two extra seats, then two into 100 into 30 is your monthly overhead. Right? So should you invest in this is it will you get more profit by doing this and you you should not keep increasing the number of seats right after a point it will not be worthwhile so what is the optimum number of seats you should have suppose you want to find out all this okay 
now uh, what you could do is you could write a little code for modeling this system simulate it and get some answers so what i'm going to discuss in the lecture today is simpy so i have written a little simpy code for this vada pav stall here is a code and i'm not going to walk through it but i'm just going to run it so this is a code which is just written in a text file this is simpy and uh, i'm specifying some things like what is the operating time 6 hours into 60 so unit of time is a minute here one minute and here i'm entering the number of seats and all the other information so i have just written one model like this and also i have written the behavior of the customer so let me not not walk through this code but let me just run it so i'm just going to run it using python 3 Uh, okay. I'm just going to run this example, and after running it once, I got some log of the simulation. So starting from here, it's just simulating one one at one one minute what happens. So uh, not at one one minutes as such, but it is simulating for a total number of six hours. So if you see what happened initially at time zero. customer one arrived and occupied a seat and total seats occupied one out of six then at time 1 minute 66 seconds another customer arrived occupied a seat and so on so at some time after 8 uh, minutes or so all the seats were occupied then if you notice customer seven arrived and immediately left as all seats were full and then customer eight also left customer nine left so many customers came and they left because all the seats were full but then after some time what happened customer 1 who had come right in the beginning he finished eating and he left so now there is one seat which is empty so the next customer to arrive customer 14 they came and they found a seat and so on so this goes on for quite a while you know some people come some people leave this goes on for a long time okay and finally at simulation time 359 or something uh our simulation stops why because at this time after this time nothing happens or uh, our 6 uh, hours are over 6 hours is approximately 360 i mean it is exactly 360 uh, minutes right so uh, at about 360 minutes our simulation stops and it is printing some results total number of customers that came 103 out of these 58 were served but 45 went back because they didn't get mp seat and the total profit generated for the day was just this 58 into 100 that is 5800 if i run the simulation again uh, because these arrivals were random i might get slightly different results because every day is different so if i run it again i get slightly different results the same kind of behavior but total number of customers 106 out of these 60 were sold and therefore the profit is 6000 so if i run it a bunch of times i get slightly different answer so here is 5800 if i run it again 6000 again then 5800 again 5900 5900 5900 6000 and so on so you notice that this number is not random there is uh, there is a range of values that i am getting here so typically in the range of 5800 to 6200 some number in this range is the total profit that is the customer served is in the range of 58 to 62 something like that so maybe because this has randomness we ought to run it a multiple uh, number of times and see what is the average value we are getting and with this we are able to answer some questions right so at least the first question we are able to answer what is the average profit per day what fraction of the arriving customers have left we are able to answer this uh what about this question this is a what if kind of a question right what if we have more seats uh will it be worth it so i noticed that with six seats i'm getting a profit of 5800 or 6000 around 6000 per day profit per day so if i add let's say if i add two seats more 
is going to cost me an extra rupees uh, 200 per day for two seats so what is the profit i get so what i could do is i could just open my code and increase the total number of six seats from six to eight and uh, what do we expect we expect that since many people were leaving because all the seats were full maybe this will improve our profit right but any guesses on what what could be a profit any any of you would like to guess would it will it improve or worsen the profit improve okay so so let's try it and see uh, so i just uh, increase this and okay so it is improving it's 6500 6500 6800 6700 6400 and so on so it's improving. What if I drastically increase the number of seats? Say, suppose I uh, have this as, uh, let's say 20, 20 seats. So that's a significant increase in the number of seats. It is going to cost me 20 into 100. That is 200 or 2000 more per day. Uh, so if my profit is more than 2000 additional profit, then it is worthwhile, right? So let's try with this. Okay, so my profit here is about around 10,000 rupees now per day with 20 seats. It's nearly 10,000 if you notice this last number. So that's good. So I'm spending 2,000 extra, but I'm getting a profit of 10,000. Earlier it was about 6,000. So I'm making 4,000 more in profit, but spending 2,000 in seats. So maybe it's still worthwhile. There'll be a point after which it won't be uh, my profit won't be increasing anymore so if i want to find the optimal number of seats what should i do any guess would any of you like to uh, suggest what we could do to find the optimal number of seats for this example and actually the cost for a seat that 100 rupees is not included in this yeah it, it, this is just uh, this last line is just printing the uh, profit that means the cost of the vada pav uh, i mean the money earned minus the cost of the vada pav it is not including the cost of the seat but if you subtract from it 100 into the two extra seats uh, the extra seats cost then that will be the total profit for the day suppose that value i print suppose then um uh, Maybe we would just run the simulation a bunch of times with different values of number of seats and see where it plateaus off, right? So maybe uh, if we have the number of seats and if we plot F and let's define F to be the total profit made, that is the money earned actually, minus the number of seats, number of seats, minus six into 100. This is F and we plot it and we might see that it either it plateaus off or it uh, reduces after a while. And then we just we just measure it for a bunch of values and then find what is the optimal, right? So we could do that. So once we have a simulation model, we can do a number of things. So it seems useful. So here is an example where I have used discrete event simulation. And able just by running a simulation, we are able to answer these questions. So by the way, when we run a simulation, this detailed activity that is printed is called a log, a simulation log, right? Or just a trace. What happened in the system at every time instant? Or it is just printing all the things of interest that happened. And finally, it is printing some results. So often this this log itself is of value because you can look at it and understand what is happening. Okay. So in our system, people, many people arrived and occupied a seat and so on. So uh, we can gain insights on what happened here. So I'm sure that this example, although very trivial, is just showing us that uh, with more complicated systems, answering these kind of question is very difficult. Like what will happen if you do something? What will you happen if you uh, assume more people visit your stall? What will happen if there are seasonal changes? What will happen if you have other rush hours and so on? And uh, it's very difficult to come up with formulas or analytical expressions for these. 
So simulation is very, very useful. You just change your simulation code, you run the simulation and you see what happens. So it is very, very useful. Uh, and if your simulation runs very quickly, then you can try out a number of possible configurations and do optimization. So what we get like this, this is called a simulation trace and it is very useful. So in this tutorial, what we are going to do is go over basics of discrete event simulation and then take a look at the SymPy library. So before we get started, I want us to be on the same page about some basic terms in modeling and simulation. Okay. So uh, maybe some of you may know what is the difference between modeling and simulation or how are they related. But just to be on the same page, let me just quickly go over it. So when we think of a model, right? What is a model? A bunch of things uh, come into the mind, right? All these could be called a model. This is a model airplane. This is a model train. This is a model of a riverbed. This is a model of a 3D model of a car uh, body. This is model of a flight simulation engine. This is a fashion model. This is a model of a building and so on. All are models. And uh, if you think about the types of models, right? So what is a model? Well, if there is a real system, let's say it's an airplane, then we could have a number of uh, different models. So one may be a physical model where you're just, this is like a miniature airplane. And what is it capturing? What is this? What is similarity with the system? The shape and the size is not the size, but just the shape and the colors maybe are very similar to the real system. But otherwise it is nothing like the real system. It doesn't fly. It doesn't have people. It is not of the same size. So it is a physical model and it is useful. Let's say if you want to, uh, you know, if you put it, want to put it in a wind tunnel and calculate how much stresses you get and so on with this shape, what happens if you change the shape of the wing and so on. So it's useful. You might want to study if you introduce a new boarding pattern for the flight, then how will that change the time for takeoff? So you might have a queuing model, like a computer simulation model of people boarding the flight and what happens and so on. So it's a queuing model. If you want to answer questions like what if you change the boarding time and you know, if you allow boarding from right to left, left to right, or you might want to analyze if you change the shape of the wing, how does it change the drag uh, and how, how does it change the stresses on the joints in this aircraft? So you might want to do physics simulation or the purpose of a model could be to train a pilot. So it could be for flight simulation where there is an interactivity between, between the human. So when the human presses some control buttons, the simulation predicts what the scenery outside will look like and how the airplane will respond to it. So that's a flight simulator with the purpose of training. Or you could just have some formulae which are the analytical models. So here, is, here are some examples of I think it's too small to be visible, but these are formula for uh, expressing the drag on the, sorry, the lift on the wings uh, for different shapes of the wings. So uh, this could simply be an analytical model where you plug in the values and the formula gives you some result. You don't have to run any simulation as such, but we are just talking about models, right? All of these are models of one real system. So if you ask what is a model, a model is just a representation of the real system that mimics some of its aspects while ignoring some other aspects. So like, for example, a physical model ignores uh, electrical subsystems in a plane and it ignores uh, the aspects of the plane that make it fly and so on. It just copies the shape and shape of the plane, right? Or a queuing model just mimics the aspect where people board the flight. It ignores the shape and size of the flight. So depending on what you want to do, you will model some parts of a system and ignore some other parts. That makes your model simple and allows you to focus on only few parts that you want to focus on. So depending on the uses, we have different types of models and the uses could be to get in, gain insights or to predict what happens or to optimize or for the purpose where you want to have a human interact with the model, like for training a pilot, or for playing a computer game. You want to simulate what happens in a flight and so on. Or you want to visualize and show, like say for example, a 3D model of a house and you want to show the customers that this is what your flat will look like if you buy this flat. So 
then we have types of models so we have seen what is an analytical model just a formula okay or it may or may not be closed form but it is it, it, is like a analytical expression or you might have a physical model or different kinds of models so computer simulation model is one type of a model so this model is of relevance for systems which are dynamic in nature so what is a dynamic system it's any system that has a time axis and we are interested in analyzing the behavior over time so if you look at this example where there is just an analytical model there is no time axis as such we are just calculating the lift as a function of the wing shape but in this model there is a time axis this model there is a time axis and this model there is a time axis in the physical model there is no time axis uh yeah is there a question from one of you i can hear some sound no if there is a question uh at any point of time feel free to stop me uh and unmute yourself and ask since uh, i cannot see the participant list it's fine if you unmute and ask there is a question in chat box will you take it now yeah sure uh so yes, can you unmute yourself and ask uh you want the participant to ask pratim yeah it would be good if pratim so just ask your question so uh, ma'am can you share this program on c++ also means uh, can we make this program on c++ also that word up also means the code uh, so, like python yeah you can you can but you will have to do lot more work if you want to avoid some of the work some of the complexities you can use an existing library and just create a model of your example so we will see exactly what you need to do to model okay. it in c++ or python we will see that uh, in the later second half of this tutorial okay okay so uh, exactly how do you write a python code we will we will see python examples but if you were to do it in c++ hmm. uh, essentially the same object oriented so what what okay. will be your objects we will see that okay so uh, yeah so when we are talking about simulation we are only talking about dynamic system models okay so any any system that have a time axis this may be obvious to some of you but just to be on the same page we are just going over some preliminaries okay so uh, basically if you have a real system then you abstract out some features of it uh, ignore some other features and observe real system by measurements and so on make some assumptions make some approximations and you build a model and if this is a dynamic system and this is a computer simulation model then we can run that model and that act of running the model is called simulation okay so modeling is the job of actually observing the real system and from the real system constructing a model that means making the right assumptions or making the measurements and so on to build a model and when you run the model that is if you progress on the time axis and see what happens to the state of the system that action is called simulation and when you do the simulation a simulation might give you a detailed activity log like in the vada pav example it might give you some statistics predictions insights and so on and then often there is a loop between the model and the real system and simulation because we might have made some mistake in making the model so when you simulate you see that some things don't match the real observed things so you go back and change your model and you continue this until you are satisfied that this model sufficiently reflects the real system so this is a uh, difference between what is modeling and what is simulation now uh, just to be clear what is a state can in someone uh, say what is a state when we talk about a model there may be a state right what is a state can somebody suggest what is meant by a state of a system like when you say what is the state of the economy or you know what is the state of your value of the variables that are associated with a certain object okay like excellent so you distance yes okay excellent so you uh, have when you say values of the variables you are already thinking about a computer model but if you have any any model okay 
then state uh, is significant when when you are talking about dynamic systems that means some system which is evolving over time so if this is the system in at time t1 and then some other it changes at time t2 and so on what is it that is changing in the system if you represent that information in one place that could be called the state of the system so essentially state of the system is changing with time like if you have the vada pav example the state is what is the state in the vada pav example can somebody say the number what of the people that are present at a time t years in the correct so out of the six seats uh, how many are occupied just a number so how many people are present just n some number uh, let's say initially there was zero then after some time one arrived then 2 3 4 5 6 then one left then one more came one one left one more came this was what was happening to the state of the system over time so if we were interested in if the seats were different in our vada pav example some seats were special seats costing more and some seats were ordinary seats and so on we will also want to track in which seat was occupied and which was not occupied and so on so that will also be a part of the state in the current example all the same six seats were the same so we didn't care uh, other things in the state could be like if you are doing a weather simulation uh, and let's say this is some area at every point in some area you may be tracking over time how the temperature uh, evolves and how the pressure evolves and so on so these temperature and pressure variables at every point of time could be the state of the system so you all know state is something that evolves over time and something that is constant across the simulation is often called a parameter like in our vada pav example we said the number of seats was 6 and we ran the whole simulation with this value so this did not change in the entire simulation this was a constant for the simulation so that could be like a parameter or attribute of the simulation once you set its value you don't change it during the simulation or for example how many uh, times a person uh, how, how what is the cost per person or the profit per person etc those were fixed values so that is the parameter and then you know you saw that in the vada pav example uh the simulation for 6 hours took a few milliseconds maybe 6 millisecond maybe whatever some time it took so let's see how, how much time it took it, it took very little time so you could just type uh, time and then so it took uh 0.3 seconds okay so it took a very small amount of time so what what time are we referring to when we talk about time we are talking about two things uh, in fact we are talking about three things one is the physical time or the real time of the system so if this is a real system suppose you are modeling weather weather and you uh, in your weather prediction you want to say that on tuesday there will be rain on wednesday there on thursday there will be rain again and so on so this time exact time of the real system is a physical time okay the time that has that has meaning for the real system so like so if you want to say at 6 pm on tuesday some thunder thunderstorm will start and so on this is a physical real time but notice that if you have a simulator you might run the simulation for an entire week one weeks weather simulation you might run on your computer in one minute right it might take just one minute on your computer to run the weather simulation for one week so what you have is you have like a time variable right in your simulation let's call it t and then initially t is set to 0 then t is incremented to 1 t is incremented to 2 and this may be representing the number of hours so at 0th hour the real time was 6 pm tuesday and the simulation time value was t and it was 0 and then you did some simulation here then you advanced t to 1 that is after 1 hour uh which corresponds to 7 pm on tuesday and so on okay so this time variable that we increment in our simulations is just called simulation time okay it just is just our time variable for the simulation 
and finally we have wall clock time that means when you actually run this simulation on your computer how much time did it take to run so suppose we run one weeks weather simulation so this duration is one week of the real system the simulation time takes values 0 1 2 3 4 5 whatever but actually on my computer when t was 100 what was the time on my computer when i started running that is called the wall clock time so i started running at time 0 when i reached at simulation time 100 that is 6 pm plus 100 hours what was the wall clock time on my computer so maybe this took 1 minute to execute so this may be 1 minute so these three are separate things so just to be sure that uh, we know what is simulation time simulation time is just a time variable right and depending on what is the relation between this and this we have different types of simulation so one is as fast as possible this is like my vada pav example i just ran the simulation okay and it did the 6 hours of simulation for me in 0.3 seconds so it just took 0.3 seconds on my computer to simulate for 6 hours of the vada pav stall so this is as fast as possible the second is real time if you want to keep the simulation time in sync with the wall clock time like this could happen where suppose you are simulating something uh, and when one second elapses in your simulation one second should elapse in the real world on your computer when two seconds elapse two seconds should elapse here so any so why would you want to run something like this any reason why you would want to do real time simulation Uh, uh, to analyze each and everything uh, about a uh, uh, minute time out okay yeah mm -hmm. i'm for experimenting we have to if we have to compare it with something in real life so it right. would be if better to simulation. have it at the same time correct correct so there is a simulation and supposing it has to closely interact with a human being or something in the real system like say this is simulation of a car and it is simulating whether you know uh something is happening and there is a real car and it is comparing the two and checking if the control is working or not or a best example is a computer game so if you are playing a computer game and you press the accelerator okay in the computer game the car should move forward so how much should the car move forward and suppose it hits a tree after how long should it hit a tree you your computer will simulate that and say that after 1 uh, millisecond the car should hit a tree but in the real uh, system uh, when you're playing right you should also feel that it took 1 millisecond or it took 10 seconds so it should you should also feel it correctly so it should take 10 seconds so artificially the simulation is slowed down often so that the wall clock time is matching with the simulation time variable so if this is your simulation time 0 1 2 3 and so on and if you want it to match exactly with 0 seconds 1 second 2 second and so on what you can do is you can finish this computation very quickly and then just wait for 1 second then finish this computation then wait for 1 second and so on so you can artificially sync up the real time and the wall clock time and this is very useful when you want to do real time simulation so if the system if you want to simulate a delay of 10 minutes to run it also we should actually take 10 minutes and this is useful whenever there is a human interacting with the simulation model like a game or you want to simulate a car or you know any any condition where this should feel like the real system and then we have like a combination of the two where uh it's a scaled real time so if zero this is meant to be one second this interval is meant to be 1 second you actually have a 0.1 second elapse so here again 0.1 second and so on so it is some known unit but it is a scaled version and often it is useful say for example if you have a car simulation and you want to know what happens if you speed everything up in some time and so on if you 
make the time go two times faster, what will it look like and so on. So it is useful to have scaled simulation. So, okay. So we can do all three in SymPy, by the way. We'll come to that. So what is discrete event simulation? So you know what is a state? So we have two types, continuous and discrete event. So in the continuous, the state of the model can change continuously with time. So if this is time and this is the state, see for example, uh, you want to model how the temperature of your oven changes with time since you turn it on. So you increase it and then it improves. And I tell you, identify the exact time at which the state was changing. You'd say, oh, there is not a one time instead. It is continuously changing. In all of this interval, it is continuously changing. So suppose uh, if you have a system that is changing like this, then you say that here it is changing. Here the state is changing. And in this inter interval, it is changing continuously. So anytime you have the state evolving continuously with time, it's a continuous system model. So it is continuous. So if you want to simulate such a system, you describe it typically with a set of differential equations or you know just algebraic equations or ordinary or partial differential equations. So for example, here is a, here is a system where uh, some, some pressure is increasing as t square. Okay, you describe it like this. And then you say, okay, what will happen after t plus delta t? Okay. But in discrete event system model, we assume that the state changes happen only at some time instance. So for example, a Vada Pau stall, if you plot the number of people in the system, initially there are zero people, then one person comes, another person comes. So this becomes one, two, and so on. So one person arrived at time T1, the second person arrived at time T2 and so on. If you write down the set of time instants at which the state changed, you will get a countable set. You can count these time instants at which the state change. It's not like a continuous interval when the state is changing, right? So let's call that an event. Anytime the state changes is called an event. So here, for example, if these are the number of customers in a system, then at this time, one customer came, this time, one customer came. At this time, a customer left. So this count went down and so on. At this, this time, two customers came maybe and so on. So these points of time are called events. And if you have a countable such events, countable set of events, that is called a discrete event system. Fine. So you, you, you know, you can assume that the state is changing only at some time instance. Okay. So far so good. So we are focusing on discrete event simulation models now in this tutorial. Okay. So in what systems does state change only at these discrete times? So, uh, it's easy to think of, uh, things where, uh, customers arrive or people leave or people leave in the queue or telephone calls arrive. Okay. So things like that, where state is changing only at discrete time instance. So I have a, a quick question for the audience. So supposing you have a petrol pump and you have a tank. Okay. And you have the level of the tank, which is a variable state variable. What is the state variable? The level of the tank. And, uh, what happens is, um, you know, people come, at the petrol pump and they take some petrol away. So the level is reducing. So initially the level was zero. Then first customer comes, the level decre uh, decreases. And second customer comes, third customer comes. And then a refill vehicle comes and you refill the tank level and it reduces slowly and so on. But these values can be anything. Like first customer can consume 1.2 liter. Second customer can consume 0 0.3333 liters and so on. So these values, the amount, the change in the level can be the real valued. So is this an example of a discrete event simulation? Is it example of a discrete event model or is it a continuous model? Discrete is, event. Can somebody discrete? discrete uh, why would discrete you say so? Event. 
yeah because the times at which we assume so actually the level will change slowly right because as you start the uh, pump and the petrol will be drawn from the tank and it will slowly reduce but if we want to model that do we really want to model that or we are just assuming that after the first customer comes he takes 1.2 liter so level becomes old level minus 1.2 liters the second customer comes so it becomes level minus 0.33 liters and so on so we don't uh, we just assume that the state is changing in the steps whenever a customer arrives or leaves so we can consider this as a discrete event simulation model uh, and here is another example where something is changing and the time instants can be real valued like the first customer arrives at 0.333 seconds the second one arrives at 4 seconds 5 seconds this arrives at 5.1119 seconds this times are all real valued they are like not integers is it still a discrete event system yes yes it is so it doesn't doesn't have to be integer values at of time as long as this set of events this time stamps is a discrete or a countable set you can count uh, the number of events in the system so uh, okay so we uh, we understand what is a discrete event model and this kind of a system assumption that state is suddenly changing at this is useful for a variety of systems like you know computer networks where packets come and packets leave the router and so on or digital logic if you have seen uh, any language like vhdl or verilog these are digital design languages uh, if you want to simulate in this languages you will use a discrete event simulation or if you want to simulate computer architecture like what happens on some clock cycles or if you want to simulate traffic networks where a car comes at a in intersection like a traffic uh, light intersection and a car leaves here or leaves here that could also be a discrete event model so it is a lot of the systems that we see we can assume these things that state is changing continuously and that makes our simulation simpler compared to continuous simulation so okay so now how can we do this discrete event simulation suppose you want to model the vadapav example or any other sim simple example how can we do it and can you use a language such as c c++ or python directly uh, for this or are some constructs missing so can somebody say what may be missing so to give an example suppose uh, we want to model a airport you know at the airport there are these counters check in counters are there suppose there are three check in counters and then there are queues of people waiting and you know that every person takes around 10 minutes to do their check in and and um, people arrive at a certain rate and so on you and you want to ask questions like if you have one more counter will it, will it be better will the service improve and so on so if you want to model this in c++ or python what aspects could be missing from the language i mean what would you have to do extra anyone uh, wants to suggest so uh, so maybe the things that are missing are one is that these things are happening in parallel right many things are happening generating in parallel generating visuals ma'am generating visuals news visual generating visuals yes generating visuals is surely yes but if visuals are not important for your simulation like in my vada for example here there are no visuals it is just text right uh, so yes. i could have done this using a simple c or python program but what is missing is that when you want to simulate things are happening in parallel right like this counter this counter this counter is all running in parallel and people are entering and leaving all this is happening in parallel uh, so things are happening concurrently actually and often your c c++ or python code is written one after the other like sequential so you need concurrency but then you say you might write a multi threaded program or something okay so that might take care of this but then what is missing is like you want a simulated time variable you want a time variable 
and what you need to do is increment this time variable and see what happens in the entire system so at one time let's say at time equal to 1 second many things could be happening in your system people entering people leaving many things could be happening so you would have to do something about it okay so you would have to keep track of what happens at the same time and so on so yes the answer is yes you can write it in c c++ python but you will have to write some extra code for these two things okay so what have people done is they have uh, so when you write a code suppose for the vada pav example you write python code there will be two parts right one part is specific to your model specific to your example like say the vada pav stall how many customers come how much time do they take and so on this is specific to your system and the other is some general purpose things which will remain same even if your model changes like instead of vada pav if you want to model a airport counter or if you want to model a digital circuit there will be some things in your code which will stay the same so that people have made libraries okay so this is the general framework which provides the time variable and how that time variable is updated and so on so this becomes your discrete event simulation framework and in addition to this you write some code or some you know graphical user or something to describe what is your system so some you have to model say driving leaving and so on that description is specific to your system so you have to have that plus some general simulation framework code which will do the simulation for you which will update the time and change the state and so on okay so this discrete event simulation framework is what simpy provides and many other libraries provide in c c++ and so on and this you have to write for your every example for every example that you create you have to write some description of that system right so suppose you want to model a digital circuit like some and gates and some or gates and something like this you have to describe your circuit so you can use a language like vhdl or verilog and so on and then there will be a simulation framework or simulation engine which will have the code to actually do this simulation so vhdl or verilog languages are for just digital circuits but simpy is a general purpose framework which is this okay so what constructs are missing is concurrency and time variables uh, okay so many things are concurrent so what you need is you will model the state of the system as variables fine you will model the simulation parameters as constants for example every customer generates a profit of 100 rupees so that 100 could be a constant then you will have a variable t to model your simulation time and initially you will say t equal to 0 and maybe you have a for loop where t is incrementing right so how will t increment should t increment in fixed t plus equal to delta t some for loop and t is incrementing in fixed amounts if you have this you cannot model things like you know something happens at time 0 then 1.33 and then at 5.889 and then at 6 and then at 7.3 you cannot have any delta t which is the same for all of this you will have to see the least common um, i mean the highest common factor for all these time intervals so it may be difficult to find such a delta t or you can say that let's approximate that everything in my vada pav stall happens one second apart so this is my finest granularity so even if something happens at 1.5 seconds i'll say it happened at 2 seconds i will just adjust everything on one second boundaries then i can do something like this right i'll just increment my time and do some processing so these are two approaches in fact to discrete event simulation okay so fine so we have a time variable t and then we need to just have code to describe what happens for every event like what happens when a customer comes and uh, how much profit does it generate and so on so we can have some functions or code to model events and every event happens at some time so it has a time stamp right so this is at least the building blocks that we need for doing our simulation okay 
so now there are two approaches to this one where you start your time variable equal to 0 and you just have a for loop in which you are doing t is equal to t plus t plus some delta t you have a fixed time interval so you simulate at 0 then at 1 then at 2 3 4 and so on so you assume that nothing happens in the system in between how can you do that you can choose this to be very small so suppose you have your vada pav stall you say that i will assume that things happen only one second apart like nothing happens between these one second boundaries it's a approximation it's just approximation and then you simulate at 0 update the state then you advance the time to 1 update the state then you advance the time to 2 update the state advance the time to 3 update the state and so on you could do that or you could do the second approach which is t equal to 0 and t in a for loop you, you update time to the next event of interest whenever the next event should happen so if the first event happened at 0 the next at 1.33 then just update it to that then it next should happen at 5.8 update it to that and so on if you can do this then this is called a event stepped approach and this is called a time stepped approach so uniform increments or un non uniform increments so uh, to make this clear if you have the time stepped approach then you are incrementing time in fixed units so in this diagram okay we see that discrete event simulation has these two approaches event stepped approach and event driven approach time stepped approach and event driven approach and continuous simulation is also often discretized that means you just divide time into very small delta t's and you do do it like this so in the time stepped approach if your system has three objects a b and c suppose a b and c are counters in your airport or they are customers in your system or any any objects like say uh, if you are using uh, some banking simulation and a b c could be the banking counters what you do is you change the state of a b and c at regular time intervals in the time stepped approach these intervals can sometimes change like here it is changing but that's okay but this delta t is fixed this time interval is fixed the other is called a event driven approach and this is what simpa uses and this is what typically discrete event simulation approaches use in this approach what we have is we have one big queue which is called a event queue and in this event queue initially it is empty but we will insert events in this queue sorted by the time stamp okay so it is a sorted queue in which we will insert some events as they should happen so suppose code for a looks like this okay at time uh, wake up at time 0.1 second and uh, change the state of this object a and code for b might look like uh, wake up at 0.9 seconds and do something and code for c might look like do something now and then wake up at point time 3.88 and do something so initially you will run this code okay when you run this code it will change the state of this object and it will schedule a new event at time 0.1 second so that will get inserted here 0.1 second e4 some something should happen in the queue fun we are done with a now execute the code for b when you execute it will change the state of b maybe it will change the state of something c whatever and it will schedule an event at time 0.9 seconds so it will insert this event here and it is also supposed to do something to a at time uh let's say this is a 0.1 second 
some something else to a at point one second. Oh, sorry. A schedules an event for itself at this time, one point eight one second. So B is schedule something for A at time, point nine second. So in, insert that also in the list. And C when it runs, it changes its state and schedules a new event for itself, like a wake up event, at time three point eight eight. So that is also inserted in the queue. Once you finish looking at all of these three objects, our time variable was zero initially. What happened when we executed objects A, B, and C at time zero? These objects, when they ran, they created new events. The new events got pushed into the queue at the right place because this queue is sorted by timestamp, this increasing timestamp. So they got inserted into this queue. And it also changed the state of objects A, B, and C. So we have finished executing at time zero. Now we look at the queue. Our queue had this earlier. Nothing happens. Then at point one it had something, and then it had something at um, this. It had these three entries. Okay, the queue had these three entries. All this was not there. So we look at the next timestamp. The next one occurs at point one. So we update t to the next value that is point one. Till point one, nothing is supposed to happen in the system. So now we update the event to t at point one, and look at the queue. So something e four is supposed to happen at this time uh, to object a. So we some ha we have some pointer to object a. So we go to object a and execute. This event, okay. So execute object A at that time. This one, and then what this does is this might change the state of A or create more events and so on. So it doesn't. It's not creating any more events. So then we go to the next event. So what is the next event? So B had scheduled some event for itself at time point nine. So update the time to point nine for everybody and so on. So what we are doing is essentially we are updating t to the next event in this queue. Finish processing it. When we finish processing everything at that time, it might create some new events in the queue, and it will change the state of the system. Once we are done with it, look at the next timestamp. Go to that timestamp. Look at all the events that should happen. Process those events. They might in turn create some other events and change the state of the system. When we are done with that, look at the next timestamp in the queue, and so on. So what we are doing is we are not stepping in regular time intervals of delta t, but we are just looking at what should be the next event of interest in the queue and executing that. So this is a kind of a vague idea of how event-driven simulation is working. Okay. Uh, at this point, are there any questions? We will see this uh, in SimPy, but any questions so far? Ma'am, when we are updating to point nine second, uh, in between that for every every point one time, every point one intervals, there something uh, happening with them or not? <laughs> no, nothing is happening. Nothing is happening in between these. Uh, so what we do is initially we looked at this code for A, ran it, code for B, ran it, and code for C. Huh? So we are done with this time stamp zero t equal to zero. We ran the code for A, B, C. When we ran the code, that code did some side effects. Had what did it do? It changed the state of A, changed the state of B, changed the state of C, and it generated more events. When it generated more events, we pushed those events, we inserted those events in the queue at the appropriate place, because this queue is always sorted by time. So A, when we ran, it scheduled this event for itself at time. Uh, 1.18. So we inserted this event. B when we ran it created two events. It created something for A at time 0.1. So we inserted it here, and it created something for itself at time 0.9. So we inserted this. And what did C do? C created an event for itself 
at time 3.88. So we added this. When you have finished processing for time 0, t equal to 0 finished. As a result, we changed the state of ABC and we created several new events. We created, we, uh, we created this event, this event, this one and this one. These new things got added in the queue. Done. What happens to T now? How do we increment T? We do not increment T in point steps of point 0.1, point 0.2 and all. We just look at what is the next thing in the queue. So in the queue, the next smallest value happens to be this one, point 0.1. So something is scheduled at point 0.1. So I directly jump and update T to point 0.1. And then I look at the queue. So I, I can throw out this. This is already done. Now in the queue at point 0.1, Something should have happened on A, right? Maybe this is like a pointer that tells me what, what is the code that I should run. So this event is like, a, you know, it's pointing to some code that I should run on A. So I go and run that code on A. Okay, so that, that is another event. Okay, okay, okay. Understand. Yeah, so that is another event on A. So when I run that code, this event has not created any other events, if you notice. So done. So I'm done with this also. Next is this point 0.9. So I take up this point 0.9. At point 0.9, only something is happening on B here. OK, so I execute that. And when I finish it with that, it's not doing it. It's, it's changing the state of B, maybe. And it is scheduling one more event here later on somewhere at time 4.8. So I insert this into the queue. And done. At point 0.9, nothing else happens. So done. This We are done. The next is 1.81. At this point, something should have happened on A. So we go to this event. We run this event. This creates one more event at time 3.7. So we insert this. And it also creates something for B at time 4.5. So we insert this. And nothing happens on B and C at this point, 1.8. So we are done with this also. So now in the queue, we have these things remaining and so on. So you understand the algorithm, right? We directly advance the time to the yes. next event of interest in this queue. Yes, I understand. So yes. what we is we need our code to model what we have in the system. Like if you have counters or customers, they should model be modeled by some code. Then you need a big sort of a sorted queue data structure sorted queue data structure and what this code should do is it is basically describing what is a behaving like so a uh, you know in potential uh, a could potentially schedule other events for itself or change the state so to have a simple example okay i'm going to describe this with a very simple example suppose we have a we are modeling a um, house containing three lazy people lazy or hardworking people, whatever. Us, our house has three people, A, B, and C. A, B, and C. Each of them work for some time, then they eat for some time, and then they sleep for some time, and the cycle repeats. So suppose A works for uh, 10 minutes, then eats for one minute, and then sleeps for 100 minutes. So A seems to be a lazy person, and B uh, works for five minutes, eats for five minutes, and sleeps for five minutes and repeats. And C uh, works for 100 minutes, eats for 10 minutes, and then sleeps for five minutes. Very different temperaments. And we want, and they all have one couch in their home. And it's shared. So at one time, if somebody's sleeping, then others have to keep waiting for that couch. If you want to model this system, OK, let me model B, code for A, code for B, and code for C. Code for A will look like this. At time 0, do something. What should it do? It should just schedule a wake up after time 10, right? It should just wake up after 10 minutes and do nothing. And just remember that A was working for this time. Similarly, B should schedule a wake up after 5. C should, should schedule a wake up for 100. So, what will happen after that? Who will be the first to wake up? 
Anyone? B. After birth, B. B. So initially, T was zero. Then our simulation will finish doing this work, and some things will go in the queue. Next value that T will take is directly five. And at five, our Q will point to B, and B will be woken up. When B wakes up, it will schedule itself another event for after five more times. So at time t equal to ten, it will schedule something. So at t equal to ten, A is supposed to wake up and start eating, and B is supposed to wake up and start sleeping. So and uh, so fine. So next advance will happen is at time t equal to ten. So A should wake up and start eating. change its state from working to eating b should wake up and change its state from eating to sleeping and c should also wake up no c wake up at 100 and so on ma'am ma'am so, ma'am I, ma i think so w means work not wake up i think so no no uh, i mean uh, yeah ma'am work work eat and sleep so w stands for work but what is happening in that 10 uh, time is like you know wake up means is just like uh, you wake up that process is what i meant you wake up the code so for 10 units of time nothing is happening right so like this object a is idle so what do you do you just want to activate object a or come back to object a after 10 units of time so it's like you want to wake up this object that's what i meant by wake up okay so yeah, of course wake up is actually so i i stop using that term i'll just say activate or something like that So A is idle and it will get activated after ten units of time. So you assume that those ten amounts of time were spent in working. After ten units of time, A will be activated, and it will change its state from working to eating. And it will schedule a wake up for itself or activation for itself after one unit of time. So initially for ten units of time, at time zero. you ran the code for a and then after 10 minutes 10 units of time you ran the code for a again and then again after 1 minutes of time you ran the code for a and after 100 units of time again you ran the code for a right so you ran the code here here and here in between it was idle it was not doing anything but you just change the state here to working here you change the state to eating and here you change the state to sleeping and it was fine if they were not interacting but now you said that there is a common couch so what happens is the first person to get the couch will occupy it and all the others should keep waiting and so on so how do we do that we can have create some more events called couch empty or couch available and do the simulation so we will see the exact example in simpy we see this uh, example but for now you understand the basic idea we have some code and these events should wake up and point to the appropriate code and wake up the objects and what can an event do an event can change the state of the object and schedule new events so if you have a code that gives you this data structure and it has a time variable and you know has a way of updating the time variable to the next event in the queue and throw out some event or check where these events are pointing to and finish that then essentially you have a discrete event simulation framework using the event driven approach so to summarize time step simulation approach you're just advancing by fixed increments so t1 t20 t25 and so on sorry a uh, fixed increment but you assume that interesting things only happen at multiples of that so these are integer values right so our delta t could be 1 so t will be 0 1 2 3 and only at t 20 something interesting is happening but still you are incrementing time one by one whereas in the event step approach you are directly jumping t to the next event in the queue so uh, this is the picture we saw okay so at if this is your time stamp then you just have a while loop while your queue is not empty what do you do time t equal to 0 then while not empty you increment the time to the next in the queue then execute whatever events happened at that time when you execute that code it might create new events or it might change the state that's fine so update the state state of new events remove this from the queue now remove this and repeat 
then look at the next thing in the queue, the next thing in the queue and so on. And if your queue is empty, that just means that no more events of interest now left. So you're done, right? This is your discrete event uh, simulation algorithm using time stepping, event stepping, sorry. So this is your event stepped um, discrete event simulation algorithm. So I will be sharing these slides with you. So if you want to go back to these text descriptions, you can do so. I'll be sharing the slides and the codes with you. So you have uh, now, how do you, you know, point, have this point to a code, you just have a pointer or it's called a callback function. If you have used callback functions in Python, basically this object stores pointer to a function and that function will be called. So if you have written your person ABC as a class and you have some function called behavior, then this could store a pointer to that behavior function and it should call it back. Okay. So, so we have a uh, SimPy, which is a discrete event simulation library in Python. And uh, it current version is for so it's a very stable sort of library. It is based on Python generator function. So since uh, we don't have much time, uh, Python has a yield keyword, which is exactly like your return keyword in C++ or C. You know, you have a function and then you have return, right? Return three, return four, like that. What it does is it returns a value and the function ends. In Python, the generator has a yield keyword. What it means is the function returns the value, but the, it pauses, control pauses over there. So it's like if you call this function, my generator n with n equal to zero, it will return the value one. But next time you call this function again, it will the control will go to second statement and it will, it will return the value three, it will return the value four and so on. So it pauses when it returned last time. So if this was your function and here you have yield, it, the function next time when you call it, it will go to this line and it will go to this line and so on. So you have this interesting feature in Python called generator functions, which are basis of SymPy. And uh, SymPy gives you features for delays, shared resources and process interactions. So uh, just one example that I'd like to discuss. With you. So this is, this examples are written in SymPy. So here is the simple human example. Okay, it's just a few lines of code. If you see, you have a function called person and person has a name and how much time they work, eat and sleep. Okay. And while true, person A will say person A is working and then wake up after some time. Then they are eating and wake up after some time. And then they wait for availability of the couch. And then once they get works for 10 units of time, eats for four units of time and sleeps for 10 units of time. B does this and C works for 50 units of time, eats for two units of time and sleeps for 50 units of time. And that's it. A very small code to model this. And then you can run it. Um, When you run it, it's running for some amount of time and you can see the log. At time zero, person A is working, person B is working, person C is working. At time one, person B started eating. And at time seven, person B occupied the couch and is sleeping and so on. So this is running the simulation. So it's a very small code to do this. And for the lack of time, now we don't have enough time to go over uh, the features of SymPy that I wanted to discuss. So what I will do is instead, I will share all these code examples with you via Google Drive. So I have these simple examples here. So one is the example for the Vadapao stall, which is also here. This is the example, it's slightly bigger code, but not very big, about 80 lines of code for the Vadapao stall example. We have this simple humans, which is just 10 or so lines of code and so on. So I'll share all of these code examples with you and um, we have 
this link if you want to learn simpy better this is a very nice tutorial for learning simpy and these are books on discrete event simulation these are names of the books that you might find uh, on amazon and so on and here is an interesting youtube channel it's called primer which uh, shows the use of discrete event simulation for modeling growth survival and so on of these blob creatures so it's just a very illustrative uh, lay person's view of how simulation could be used to show evolution growth and so on it's a very very interesting channel and um, here are if you want to go deeper then these are the conferences and journals that are focused in the area of simulation okay and um, here is a google drive link containing all the code examples so i will also paste this uh, in the chat window for those of you who want to I'm going to paste it in the chat window. So, if you want to download the code examples, you can do it from this link. So, with that said, we'll stop the presentation. Thank you, everyone. And I think because we are running a little short of time, I could not go in detail on Simpy. So, yeah. So, let me stop sharing my screen. Or if there are any questions, I can take them. Are there any questions? Can ask the question. Ma'am, in that airport example, you told mm -hmm. us that uh, even multi-threading uh, won't help because, uh, for the parallel part. So why is that? Because you want control on uh, time. So you need to have a time variable, right? Uh, so time is not real time. It's like, uh, suppose you're saying that person A is doing something uh, after one second, person B is supposed to wake up after two seconds, person C is supposed to wake up after three seconds. Suppose you model this as parallel threads and you have a wait, wait uh, or a sleep, you know, a sleep uh, keyword in C++, right? It will just delay and wake up after one second. And this will wake up after two seconds, this will wake up after three seconds. It is fine if they are not interacting with each other, but they are interacting with each other and you want uh, all of them to have a common view of time. So, right. So this is okay for real time simulation also, but if your, if your time is, um, uh, I mean, the time should increment the same for all of these concurrent objects in the system. So if your system has three airport counters and you're modeling th these as three parallel threads, um, suppose this causes something to happen here at time 11. But this has actually gone ahead in time 12. And now later on, it finds out that something should have happened at time 11. There's no way to go back in time. So this becomes tricky. But this is an entire area of research. It's called parallel and distributed discrete event simulation. So if you search for PDES, this is the area of research. How do you do simulations using parallel computers or you know, multiple threads? So because of this problem, you know, this thread goes ahead and it, its time is 12. And then it realizes that something should have caused something to happen at time 11, only later. So you can't go back in time. So that becomes a problem. So I hope I answered your question. So this is an area of research, actually. Okay, ma'am. Understood. But if you're not using multiple threads, if you're just writing a single program in Python, it is easy to do. Just have a time variable and increment it. Have a cube containing all the events sorted by timestamps. Uh, any more questions? I don't think there are any questions in the chat window, so fine. Okay. No more questions. Any questions, participants? So please note this Google Drive link where uh, I'll, I have shared the code examples and I will also share the slides for this talk that you can use.
uh, i will also share the recording in the same google drive uh, location by tomorrow or so uh, and uh, for those of you who want uh, a detailed introduction to simpy and how to use simpy we can have some session uh, if you want I think uh, if there are no more questions, we can stop. Yeah, yeah. So I think there is no more questions. No? Neha, thanks a lot for that wonderful uh, tutorial. Hope all of our participants were benefited from it. So it's a nice idea to have a demo in the tutorial. Thank you, Neha, from participant side as well as from APM Goa. I would like to thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Meena, and thanks for your time uh, and for this platform. So I think we can end the meeting here. Bye, everyone. Sure, thank you. Thanks, Meena.